Well, well, look at what we have here. We have some Dreamer V3 action finally coming out after what you, you know, might have guessed is Dreamer V2. And if you haven't heard of this before, it's something to be excited for. It's a model based reinforcement learning method, and you should be excited for it for a couple reasons. One, it works on, I think, well over 100 environments consisting of things like Atari, 3D control, and even going as far as to testing in Minecraft, where they actually get diamonds using no human data, which I think they claim is a first, though. They do actually cheat on that. We'll get to that later, though. That's not the only reason. Not only does this work on a bunch of environments, it actually works on all those environments without doing any extra hyperparameter tuning, which if you have done reinforcement learning before, especially like model-based stuff, which is notoriously hard to get working, you will know how big of an achievement that is. Not only that, but if you're familiar with model-based work and you've seen things like probably Mu0 right now is one of the most successful algorithms, but it is also incredibly complicated with all the different planning it has to do in the Monte Carlo tree search and this and that dreamer v3 although it is actually pretty complicated in comparison to something like mu zero it's actually a bit simpler and it's always nice to have a simpler method that works as well or, or better in many cases and actually there is a fourth thing which is that in this paper they bring dreamer v3 up in model size from 8 million parameters to a 200 million parameter model which might seem small fine is not only do these models work better with larger models but they actually are more data efficient the model based dreamer stuff is a great line of work so i'm I'm really excited that I get to cover this. So let's get into it. What we're going to focus on first is this image you're seeing on the left right here. This is how the world model of Dreamer V2 works. And why do we want to learn this model of the world? We're essentially trying to predict the future so that we can learn from our model. Now this can be very useful because reinforcement learning is pretty data inefficient. So the idea is if we can learn a very accurate world model, then what we can do is we can use that to learn without having to extract more samples from our environment, because you know that can be very costly if we're working in the real world or something like Minecraft, where it takes a long time to actually take actions. We can't, we can only speed that up so much. Now there is a lot going on here. So what I want to do for you guys is break it down bit by bit. We'll go through each module one at a time. First, I'll show you what the inputs and outputs are. They have a helpful little few things right here. So we'll go through one of these at a time. I'll show you the inputs and the outputs. Then we'll go back up to the diagram and I'll show you how that fits into this whole diagram and why it exists. So to do that, I want to start with the encoder. The encoder takes in X, which is going to be the observation and H of T, which is going to be the recurrent state. And it outputs Z of T, which is a representation of the current state. As you can see, X of T is right here and it is just essentially your observation. So in the case of Minecraft, this is going to be a picture of the world and a few other variables to help identify the current state. And that encoder is right here. Once this observation or X of T goes through the encoder, we get out Z, which is our latent representation of the current state. You might wonder why it has this checkered pattern, and that's because it is actually discrete. And what do I mean by discrete? I mean, if we were to draw it out, it would be in a one hot representation, sort of like this. And this is what you're seeing in that diagram. Now, why do they do this? Well, it's basically just because it works better. Now, why it works better is not super clear, but this is something they tested out in Dreamer V2. They tried using a continuous latent space and then a discrete one, and they found that the discrete one worked better. I think this goes back to stuff in computer vision where they use this dis these discrete latents for things like image generation, and it tends to work better. This is actually where my research is, you know, is what it's working on, though, you know, I won't go down on that huge rabbit hole. So that's the encoder. Let's go to the next part. And next, I want to take a look at the sequence model. The sequence model takes in the current latent state, which we just talked about. It takes in the recurrent state, which we are going to talk about, and it takes in an action to predict the next recurrent state. H1 is our first recurrent state right here, and the purpose of the recurrent state is to capture things like the memory or the history of the environment, because just from our current observation alone, we're not necessarily able to tell everything about our environment. For example, if we are in Minecraft and we're looking ahead of ourselves, then we turn around, do a 180, then turn back around and do another 180. Well, we should expect the same thing to be there, right? We just did 360. We should be looking at the same thing, but because you don't have like a 360 field of view, well, if we don't have any memory, we're not going to, you know, we're just going to see something random. We're going to predict something random. So that's what the purpose of this H1, this recurrent state is. It's to keep updated what we've seen in the past so that we have an accurate world model. Now, what we do with this recurrent state is we take it along with an action and the current latent state. So we package these two together 
and we throw them with the action to predict the next recurrent state. So this recurrent state, it's a way of keeping track of memory, essentially. The next component we can get into is the dynamics predictor. Now this takes in the recurrent state that we just talked about, and it outputs a latent state. The dynamics predictor is happening right here, or I'll also draw it here because it's a bit cluttered over there. And it is taking just the current recurrent state, and the recurrent state essentially holds information about the last state and the last action. And it's trying to use that to now predict the new latent state, which the new latent state should hold a lot of information about the current observation. Why would we want to do that when we already have a way of getting the latent state? Remember, we can just take our observation, pass it through the encoder, and get the latent state. So why also have another way of predicting it? If you were wondering that, that is a good question. And it happens to do with what we're doing over here with the actor critic learning. The world model learning is purely learning a model of the world, whereas the actor critic learning is now learning about the value of different states and how to take actions to maximize the reward. Now, when we are doing this, oftentimes what we we'll want to do is we'll want to start with one observation and then from that observation predict, you know, one, two, three, four, um, and I think in this paper, they actually use 16 steps into the future. And if we want to do that, that means we're not going to know what the next observation is, right? This is going to be missing, which means we can't use it to get our next latent state. And because we can't do that, well, what can we do? Well, we can take this recurrent state and use it to predict the next latent state. That is why we have this here. It's not repetitive. It's actually there for a reason. Next, we have the reward predictors and the continuous predictor. Now, I know I said I tackle these one by one, but these are so similar. I think I can chop them off in one go. And that's because they have the same inputs. So they both take in the latent state and the recurrent state, and they output a prediction of the reward or the continual value. Here, this would just look like after H, each H right here. I'm just drawing on H2, but this would be after each one. We're going to predict C and R. R is the predicted reward for that step. And C is a prediction of whether or not to continue or not. So it's similar to predicting like a terminal flag or a done value that you would get for Jim. And then the last and final component finally is the decoder. And the decoder is, as you might have expected, the opposite of the encoder. It takes in H, uh, the recurrent state, and Z, the latent state, and it tries to re-predict the original observation. You can see the decoder pretty clearly right here. It takes in the latent state and it tries to reconstruct the original image. Now you might notice it's not exact because, I mean, we're learning a compressed latent state, right? We're not keeping all the information. It's a lossy compression and that's okay. Now those are all the components of the world model. And now that we know what all the components are, we can talk about how the learning actually happens. And again, there's a few components to the learning. So I'm going to go through them just like I did one by one, looking at each loss, telling you what they mean and showing you how they fit into this figure right here. Right here, we have the full equation for the loss. Now the betas are just uh, coefficients, so we can we don't need to pay too much attention to those. Really what we're looking at are the L pred, the L dyne, and the L rep. And those, if we scroll down a little bit, we can get a better look at what each of those, well, you know, look like. So let's go one by one, and I'll just talk about each of these. First, we have the prediction loss, and this is predicting three different things. The first term right here is predicting the original observation from the latent and the recurrent states. Now, this is essentially just the autoencoder loss, right? We're trying to reconstruct the original image. Then we have the reward prediction loss. So this is trying to predict the actual reward. And then we have the continuation loss, which is trying to predict the actual continuation. And we have real values for all of these, right? We know what the original observation was. We know what the original reward was. And we know what the if this continued or not is because we have real data that we're learning from. So if we look back at the diagram, and I'll use this second step because it's less cluttered, this right here, the difference between the predicted x and the actual x would be the first part of that. And then if we have like a real r and a real c, so these are taken from our data, not predicted, well, then we would just compare these and that would give us our loss. Now, when we do the back propagation for the decoder, it goes from the decoder all the way back to the original image. So it affects the decoder and the encoder. For the c and the r, I believe this goes through the entire thing. So for h2, it will go back through this and through the encoder. So it will update the recurrent model and it will also update the encoder. And I believe, I didn't double check on this, but I think they also back propagate through this way. I could be wrong on this, so don't take my word on this. Uh, if they do, maybe they use truncated back prop or something. I, I didn't actually check. Uh, but the point being is that these updates pretty much touch all the different modules. Next, we have the dynamics loss. And the dynamics loss is what is trying to make the latent state predictable from just the recurrent state. 
And what that actually looks like in the diagram is it's trying to push this H right here. It's trying to allow it to reconstruct the C. And remember, we need that. So once we get to the actor critic learning phase, this H actually needs to reconstruct the C so that it can predict multiple steps in the future. So there is a KL divergence here, and this is the loss that is allowing that sort of learning to happen. And then finally, we have the representation loss, which is, as you might notice, it has the same two terms here. The only thing that's different is the stop gradient is on one other than the other. It is also trying to make it so that this recurrent state can predict this latent state. However, instead of going in this direction, it's actually making this latent state hold information that is easier for this to predict. So there are two losses that are essentially just going in opposite directions, but for a similar purpose. So that is what all these different losses do, but I have left out two things here that I should talk about. And I left these out initially because they're kind of details, but they are important details. And these details have to do with how they make these losses right here work for a number of environments without having to do extensive hyperparameter tuning. So the first thing has to do with the reward right here. And the way and the thing that it is, is that they actually scale this. So if we scroll up a little bit, we should be able to see, here it is, you can see this nice graph right here. They use this sim log you can see on the top left, this function right here. And the function is the sine of x uh, times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus y. Okay, a little confusing, but they have a graph right here to show us what this looks like. And you can see in the dark blue and now in the red, this is the actual sim log function. The idea being that around the origin, it looks somewhat linear. So if you put the reward in this and your rewards between negative one and one, it's not gonna change much. However, what you'll notice is as we go out further on the x-axis, we actually sort of taper off because this is a, a log, right? Which means that as your reward keeps getting bigger and bigger, it's only going to get a little bit bigger uh, once passed through this function. So this is a way of essentially normalizing rewards without actually normalizing them. And I should also mention, they don't actually use this sim log function exactly. They train a network to imitate the sim log function, and then they use that neural network to, and I, I don't want to say normalize, but you know, scale the reward. The reason they do that, I think, is because the simlog function is not actually fully differentiable. So if they learn an approximation of it, that should be fully differentiable. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I don't know why else they would do that. So I assume that's why. Now, you might be asking, this seems like a sort of overly complicated approach. Why don't they just scale this or why don't they normalize the rewards? Well, for one, scaling won't work because scaling is dependent on the environment, right? So that's another question. But normalizing could work. The issue with normalizing is that, as it says here, it introduces a non-stationarity. Truncating uh, is also just kind of a, a not like very fine way of doing this. And the other is like adjusting network weights. It's how some groups have done this in the past. But the nice thing about Simlog is that it does the scaling and it works as they find for a variety of environments. That is the thing I want to mention about the reward. And the other detail they use so that they don't have to do as much fine tuning has to do with this max right here. You might have noticed this. I kind of just glossed over it earlier. So why are they doing this? And it's essentially because this is the dynamics loss and the representation loss are not the most important things here. They are ways that the model can more accurately predict things in the future. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is just predicting these two things, the reward and the continuation plus. So if the dynamics and the representation learning is already good enough, there's no reason to have them interfere with the process of learning the reward uh, and the continuation loss. Um, so th that's essentially uh, the reason why they're. And I think they state something similar here. This disables them while they are already minimized well to focus the world model on its prediction loss. So essentially, saying the prediction loss is more important. So we're going to prioritize that once everything else is working good enough. And by the way, if you are enjoying this, consider subscribing to the channel. I cover a whole lot of big papers like this and also some smaller ones to introduce you to niche ideas. So if that sounds like the thing for you, you know what to do. Now back into this paper, now that we know how the world model works, the next thing on the chopping block is this actor critic learning model. Now I already discussed kind of briefly how this works. So just going over it one time quickly again is now that we have this model, we can take the observation throw it into our encoder, we can get some latent state. We can also initialize a recurrent state, and then we can pass these through and get a new recurrent state, use the recurrent state to generate a new latent state, and keep doing this for every single state up to, I believe, t equals 16, so 16 future states in this case. The thing that's different here is that at each recurrent state, I should do it in the middle one, um, on top of just the reward, we saw the reward last time, but now we also have two other things being predicted. One, a value function, which essentially assigns a value. Um, so the expected return from the state, 
And then we're also deciding on an action. So we have, a, this is essentially an actor critic architecture and it works all over this latent space. It never actually sees the raw observations themselves. So let's dive into how the sort of details of that work. So a few things to know about the whole actor critic learning process. One is that we use Lambda returns and you can see the full formula for this here. This is a very sort of boilerplate reinforcement learning thing. It's essentially an in-between using in-step returns and using like a Monte Carlo return. If you don't know what that means, don't stress over it. But if you do know what it means, now you know. Talking about the critic specifically, the critic is a little bit different from maybe a standard critic in that it predicts the expected value of potentially a widespread return distribution, which that's right. That means we're using, I believe this would classify then as distributional RL, where we have a discrete regression task uh, for how the critic learns based on a too hot encoded target. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that let's say we are predicting values and we know all of our values will fall in between the values of zero and maybe like 10. What we can do then is we can turn this into five buckets. So our five buckets would be zero to two, we would have two to four, and then that continues all the way to eight to 10. So we would have our five buckets. And then let's say we get a value of zero as, so this is gonna be an actual value, but what would this zero turn into? We actually need to discretize it or too hot encode it because it's a zero and the left bucket covers zeros and we would have a one, zero, 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 zero. However, if we instead gave a two, that would be in the next bucket. So we would get a one, zero, 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 but let's say we got a one, uh, which, and let me scroll down a little bit here, which is in between buckets, right? So what do we do when we get a one? Well, I believe it would be something like this where you have 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0, 0, 0. And this way, this is still sparse and we can still sort of predict uh, distributions like this. However, it allows us to more sort of accurately pinpoint what the reward was along this scale instead of having, you know, completely discretized values where we're losing a little bit of that fine grained information. But typically using these types of distributional learning can help a model perform better, especially when you're actually expecting a distribution. And because some of these environments are going to be stochastic, that means that we're not always going to be getting the exact same returns from the exact same state. So this sort of distributional approach makes sense to use. And perhaps one thing to note is not only do they use this distributional approach for the critic, but they also use it for the rewards in the model that they learn. And now we get into the actor learning stuff. The actor learning stuff is fairly straightforward in this case. They say the actor's network learns to choose actions that maximize the returns while ensuring sufficient exploration through an entropy regularizer. None of that is weird at all. That's pretty standard, right? You want to maximize the reward um, while you also have to deal with the exploitation versus exploration problem, making sure that you get a good exploration so that even once you found a good solution, you can hopefully still find a better one. One thing they mention is that the scale of this regularizer can be heavily dependent on the scale and frequency of rewards which, you know, it could be an issue if we don't want to have to search for hyperparameters for this. So to solve this, they just normalize them using moving statistics. This is the loss function. The way they actually uh, maximize the reward ends up being through, where is it? Reinforce for uh, discrete actions and for continuous actions, they just use stochastic backpropagation. Again, I'm, I'm not going to go into how reinforce works or anything like that. That's very like boilerplate RL stuff, um, but it's a very standard way. Um, and, and this kind of follows for really the whole actor critic learning thing. What you'll notice in this paper is that the actor critic stuff really isn't too fancy. I think the only slightly fancy things are like the way they scale the rewards in the critic, right? They scale those with uh, the sim log and then they do some distribution learning. And then they also use what, like entropy here slash sc and scaling, but those aren't really too weird. It's all pretty standard stuff. I think where this paper really has its like biggest changes really come down to the model learning and a lot of these little tricks that they use to rescale rewards or do stuff like that. That's, I think, what really makes this paper what it is. It's it's the model and, and less so the learning process that happens on top of it. If anything, I think it's a really good sign that with a good world model, these very simple reinforcement learning methods for acting, like actor critic methods, can work so well. Like <laughs> reinforce is, you know, I'm maybe not as old as it gets, but it's, it's certainly not a new method. And with that, we can start heading down to the results section, which is very exciting and the results are very cool. Just as a teaser for the results, I'll show you. I think I showed this briefly earlier, or maybe I didn't. I don't even remember. <laughs> this right here. So we can see that pretty much everything. Dreamer does perform, and let me let me just erase all this so you can just see this. Dreamer does perform 
quite a bit better than all his predecessors, which is great considering Dreamer is, I believe, fine-tuned and tested on Atari and maybe one other environment. But then for the other environments like Crafter and Minecraft, uh, it, there's actually no hyperparameter tuning, which I think is one of the best parts of this paper. Again, it uses a, like a bag of tricks to get this working, which, I mean, using a bag of tricks is a little bit of annoying because it makes the method very complicated, but this isn't still isn't nearly as complicated as something like Mu Zero. So in that aspect, I, I really like Dreamer B3. Um, and as you can see, it does quite well in pretty much like <laughs> everything. We also have these results right here, which we'll get into in one second, but let's just, I want to make sure everyone knows what all these environments that we're testing in are. So overall, just some statistics, there are seven different domains that they test in. Um, these have continuous and discrete actions. Some of them are low dimensional or some of them are high dimensional dance and sparse rewards. They have different reward skills. There's two in 3D and some of it is procedurally generated. So there's really a good mix here. I mean, the, the experiments we here are really, they're great. <laughs> they're great. Um, and as I just showed you, it has great performance on pretty much everything. And again, as I also just mentioned, it doesn't change hyperparameters across any of the benchmarks. So there is the proprio control task, which is continuous control with low dimensional inputs. There is a visual control suite. So this is also continuous control. However, the agent is using images instead of like, I guess, like what would that be joint angles and whatnot? There is the Atari 100K. So this is Atari games, but you only get 100K steps or 100,000 steps to learn. There's Atari 200 million, which is Atari, but where you have 200 million steps to learn. There is the B suite, and this is just a bunch of, it's only 23 environments, but it's a bunch of different configurations of those things like cart pull and, and very well-known problems. Uh, but there's a bunch of different configurations that test things like, as I mentioned here, credit assignment, robustness to reward scale and stochasticity, memory generalization and exploration. They have Crafter. Crafter is basically 2D Minecraft. <laughs> uh, that's, I think, enough said. And then DM Lab has a bunch of 3D environments. And they don't mention it in this part, but they also, oh, here it is. Um, they also do get onto Minecraft, which we'll get down to in a bit. Now, for these graphs here that I just mentioned a little bit ago, we are looking at two things. On the right, what we are looking at is we are looking at different sized models. So they have the XS model. It starts up at 8 million parameters, and the biggest model, the XL1, goes up to 200 million parameters. And what you'll see is that, surprise, surprise, the bigger model does better. Now, if this was like a large language model paper, at this point, I would have been like, oh, larger model does better. Surprise, surprise, I'm, you know, ugh. But for reinforcement learning, there's actually not a whole lot of scaling work. So it is nice to see, I think in, in reinforcement learning, that not only does it do better, but it's it's more data efficient with a bigger model, which is great. I mean, that, that's great. I think most reinforcement learning research doesn't use big, don't use big models because it's already very expensive to train. So I'm happy to see it here. And then on the left, what we have is we have the training ratio. So this training ratio is the training ratio of replay data to real data. So that means when Dreamer V3 is training, what it does is it goes through the environment, takes actions and it gets data. And then it replays the, it puts out a replay buffer and it replays that and models out a bunch of things and learns with the model offline. The whole point of doing model-based RL, well, the main point is to be more data efficient, right? We want to be able to use our model to imagine a whole bunch of different scenarios. And what you can see is that the more we replay the data, the better these methods get, which is great to see. And up to 64, it looks like there's quite a bit of performance. So what I think this really shows is that the model really is doing its job here. The more you use the world model, the better the results get. So, I mean, I don't think there's much more to say. That's a good thing. <laughs> and I'll just restate this one more time in the scaling properties section, because I think it's really important. Increasing the model size not only increases the final performance, but it also increases the data efficiency. It's, it's just really, like, it's good all around. Now, the last thing we'll talk about for the results is Minecraft. Now, in the Minecraft task, the agent gets 100 million environment steps. And over the course of those 100 million environment steps, there are 12 different milestones that the agent has to achieve. And it only gets reward, I think, when it achieves these for the first time or, or something like that. But basically, the point is that the reward you get throughout this task is incredibly sparse. And not only is it sparse, but getting like diamonds in Minecraft is something that, you know, hardly is ever going to happen by chance. So that's what makes this really hard. It's an incredibly hard exploration problem, which means, of course, you're going to need a lot of samples to learn these things if you can learn them in the first place. Here you can see kind of what those milestones are. So starting off with wood, turning that into planks, getting a stick, getting a crafting table, then, you know, this kind of progresses until eventually you get iron 
and finally you mine a diamond and what you can see is that dreamer v3 does get diamonds and it is improving throughout the entire process i think they claim that the only method that could have done this previously used human data and everything else that just worked on our mail could not find diamonds. However, there is a big caveat to this claim, and it is right here. We following prior work 17 and increase the speed at which blocks break. Now, they increase it by, I think they mentioned 100 fold or something like that. This is a huge <laughs> issue. I mean, it's not an issue if they just want to do this for testing their algorithm, but they cannot compare it to any uh, pretty much anything else except for like this one thing they cite because this is one of the things that makes Minecraft so hard. Breaking a block in Minecraft can sometimes take 10 to 100 simultaneous actions. So you'll have to click the left mouse button down for like 10 to 100 steps sometimes. And something like that happening, like the chances are astronomical because if you let go of the button once, you have to restart the whole process. So if they break blocks essentially instantly, the Minecraft challenge suddenly becomes a whole lot easier. And that's what they say right here. A stochastic policy is unlikely to sample the same action often enough in a row to break blocks without regressing its progress by sampling a different action. So don't get me wrong, this is still impressive. It just means that they can't really compare this to other methods. So when they say Dreamer v3 is the first algorithm to collect diamonds in Minecraft from scratch without using human data that was required by VPT, they're not really comparing on a level playing field anymore. So I, I don't think these comparisons really make sense. Don't get me wrong, still very impressive, but this task is significantly easier. Still not easy, but significantly easier um, than what they might be comparing to. So in conclusion, Dreamer v3. I think this is a really, really, really great algorithm. Um, it's not like a perfect algorithm or anything. Of course, we're always getting better, but I think it's focused on the right things, which I really appreciate. It's focused on one, not having to hyperparameter tune between all these different environments, which is one of the biggest weaknesses and drawbacks of RL. A huge part of the reason I think people don't use RL right now is because one, it takes forever to learn. Having a model-based method really helps with that. Uh, but two, you have to like do all this fine tuning and hyper parenting and, and set it up specifically for your environment. And it's so hard to get working. Um, and if you're not in the field, you probably like don't realize what a headache it could be. And Dreamer v3 is really, is really going to help with both of these. Now, now that does come with the sort of con that they have to use this, these bags of tricks to get this all working. But you know, so be it, I guess I, if that's the best we can do right now, I'll certainly take it. In their conclusion, they also mentioned about some of the future work they want to do. One of those is to show how far the scaling properties of Dreamer v3 extrapolate future implementations at larger scale are necessary. Interesting. I think they already showed how well this scales and that it does start tapering off around a certain area. I am curious, like, what are they going to test it on? Because if they are solving Minecraft, like what, I I'm curious. Maybe the idea is to still test on like something like Minecraft, but just with higher parameters and see if it can learn that much quicker. I don't know. I'm just excited to see, you know, scaling research can be fun. I I've gotten kind of bored of it though, I guess you could say. <laughs> like when you see so much of it, it kind of gets tiring, especially like in NLP, but you know, no one really does it in RL, so eh, I'm still excited. <laughs> my, my enthusiasm for it has yet to wane. And then another thing is, they are also wanting to train larger models to solve multiple tasks across overlapping domains as a promising direction for future investigations. Now, this, this I'm very excited about this too, um, because this team is very talented. The authors of this paper are very talented. I know this has been tried in DeepMind already with Gato, which didn't work out too well, uh, but it was a good first step. And if this is going to help them go in that direction, I'm all for that. Models, I think, are potentially could hugely benefit the multitask problem. So if this is like a way they can tackle that, I again, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. I will certainly be keeping up with this line of work, and I'm really excited to see what comes down the line in the future. If you want to take a look at this paper yourself, I'll link it in the description. There is a whole lot more to go through. I swear, not just citations. <laughs> There's also um, a great appendix where they go over all the different experiments they ran. They have a number of ablations, like a lot of ablations. You can just see how many experiments they did. It is a backbreaking number. If you like this, consider subscribing for you know more content more like this or follow me on Twitter for some hot and spicy takes. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you next time.